Hey everyone, Joe Soto here, and I have a special guest who you're going to absolutely love. We're going to talk about um, a really simple and, and unique idea for achieving more than you really ever thought possible, the belief systems that can stand in our way. Stay with me, and I'll come right back with our guest for today. This is the Not Your Average Joe Show, where each week we bring you sales, marketing, and mindset strategies you need to get to your next level. And now, here's your host, international business mentor, Joe Soto. All right, we have Michael Heppel in the house. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Not Your Average Joe show. You are not average, Michael. Welcome. Well, uh, no, average is not where I want to be. I, I want to. <laughs> I've spent my whole life telling people they have to be brilliant. But you know, I know. I love, I love that intro. What a great intro! Listen, for people who don't know you, you are the author um, of the best-selling book "How to Be Brilliant" and several other books, and your newest book. We're going to talk about that here shortly. Yeah. But you also were called by one of my ex-clients, by the way, Action Coach, yep. um, as one of the top three speakers in the world. Congratulations on that type of accolade. That's amazing. That was that was very kind. And I think if your mum calls you one of the top three speakers in the world, that's good. But and that's good enough staged, to post it. Yeah, they've staged events with everybody who you can imagine, and um, they said, "Look, not it's top three professional speakers. We've got to get it right." So that that used to be my job. <laughs> before the current, current situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you got to add the word virtual in there. You are a brilliant success coach. Uh, technical That's a technical word. They're, you're teaching and coach on brilliance and you're a different type of coach though. And so I really love your work. And I, I uh, dove into your new book and I want to hear the backstory on it. I have 17 questions for you we might get through, but let's... Uh, talk about this. Give me some backstory on your new books. It's called 17, The Little Way to Get a Lot Done. I love that. Yeah. So look, the, the reason I wrote the book, um, I've had the idea for a long time, but the reason I wrote it was because, you know, people talk about motivation and they talk about that you, um, you know, get some real, get some big pleasure, get some big goals, all that type of stuff. Well, actually, the real motivator is avoiding pain. And that's what I was doing. I was avoiding pain by writing that book because uh, like a lot of people like a lot who do what we do, we I had to switch to doing things online and I set up a group called How to Be Brilliant, did very, very well, became a real place of positivity on the um, internet during all the stuff that's been going on. And then I asked the group, what would you like to learn how to do next? And I honestly thought it would be something maybe around customer service or time management or whatever most people how to write a book so it's like oh, yeah, yeah. Right. I've, I've written six bestsellers i can i can do that i can show you how to write a book so i created a pop-up group called write that book and then we set up a master class write that book master class and the first training session was amazing we had 75 people and they were so up for it joe it was brilliant and they had ideas and they had passion they had enthusiasm and they wanted to take their books to market and i finished that session and i was flat <laughs> I walked I walked out of my office here and I went to see my wife and she says, what's wrong with you? I went, I feel like a fraud. <laughs> I've got 75 people who are writing books and I haven't written a new book for six years. I'm a, wow. I'm a fraud. I need to write a book. I still wish you had invited me to that group, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, right, okay, what, what am I going to do? I need to, I need to write a book. So I've been teaching people this concept of 17-minute sprints being 17% better. I love the number 17. It just kind of works. I thought, right, I'm going to write a book called 17, and I'm going to write it in 17 days. And I did. So oh, that's my how gosh. It happened. You wrote it in 17 days? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm jealous. Now, now I have – you just took away every excuse I have for getting my book out there. <laughs> Come on, Joe. You gotta do it. You gotta. Seventeen do it. days. Um, Seventeen days. Yeah. And tell me why this number. Other, it's kind of a magical number, I know. But what? Yeah. Tell me why this number. Why seventeen? Why is this play such a big yeah. part in your life? And I'm asking because I kind of know the answer from reading the book, but I don't. Yeah. I want my audience to hear it. So it started. It was um, early October 1995. I was in New York. I used to be a fundraiser. 
and um, I went to see a guy called Sir Harold Evans. And Harold Evans at that time was head of Random House, the biggest publishers in the world. You know, he was a former editor of the Sunday Times and, and the Times in the UK. You know, he, he, you know, founder editor of Condé Nast. I mean, the guy's amazing. And I went to um, his office and it was the day of the O.J. Simpson verdict. Oh, gosh. And I remember arriving at this office and there was a real buzz in New York. I mean, the whole of Times Square just stopped. And people got out their cars to watch the big screens for the verdict. And then I um, arrived at his office and sat there in the waiting room. And this little light flashed three times on his PA's desk. And I was like, right, okay, this is exciting. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to go in. And just as I walked past her, she said, Mr. Heppel. I was like, yeah. She said, you've got 17 minutes. <laughs> and Joe, I don't know about you, but it's never happened to me before. No. It's never happened since. You've got 10 minutes. You've got five minutes. Right. You've got a minute, but never 17. And, and the bit that's not in the book is I walked into his office and he was on the phone. And um, he pointed at the sofa and went, take it, take it. So I went along and I sat down and he said, um, he's, this is the conversation he had. He was, he said, look, you want to do a deal. I want to do a deal. Are we going to make this happen? This is a simple yes or no. <laughs> yes. Great. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to get some people to talk to you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Put the phone down. So I always practice my opening line for a conversation. I think it's a really important thing. I don't want to be stood there muffling around. So yeah. my opening line, I'd walked all the way through New York about to meet Sir Harold Evans, and my opening line is going to be, we're about to have the only conversation in New York that isn't about the O.J. Simpson verdict. So he came and goes, hi, Michael, great to meet you. And I went, we're about to have the only conversation in New York that isn't about the O.J. Simpson verdict. Brilliant. And he looked back at his desk and he said, do you know who that was on the phone? It's like, no, he goes, that was Marsha Clark, the chief prosecutor. Oh, yeah. Doing, doing the book deal half an hour after the verdict. Michael, only in America. And wow. I was like, whoa. Mind blown. And then I had a 17-minute meeting. And at the end of 17 minutes, a little light flashed three times on his desk. He said, that's it. I've got my next thing. Cheerio. Off I went. And I sat on the plane heading home that night. And I was writing in my notes. And I just wrote down, anybody who values their time so much that they can break it into a 17-minute appointment must respect time. So I've used it a lot. And, and we do this thing called 17-minute sprints, which is a big part of 17. What yeah. you can get done in 17 minutes is amazing. That's how I wrote the book in 17 days. It was you, all 17-minute sprints. I, speaking of which, that was one of my questions. You've got 17-minute sprints that can be a whole myriad of things, from writing emails to sorting emails to thinking, reading, writing, making calls. How do you incorporate the... 17 minute sprints and sprints in your life like there's people that are listening people that are listening to this as a podcast people that are watching this right now yeah let's give them some help okay so that i i think the first thing is when i start to procrastinate yeah I use 17 minute sprints so i'll go hey siri 17 minute countdown and then that phone is going to immediately announce it's got 17 minutes and fat loads of people series will have gone off now it'll start saying yeah. 17 minute countdown i love that by the way <laughs> And then, and then it starts to count out. And at that point there, I'm like, okay, I have to achieve something that I've been putting off in 17 minutes. So it might be that call. It might be, you know, writing the email. It could be writing a part for the book. It could be tidying my desk. On a Friday, I love to have a clear desk. So as I get to the end of the day on a Friday and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, I can't be asked. I really don't want to do it. I just go, you know, hey Siri, 17 minute countdown. And then that's it. And my desk is cleaned and I polish my desk on a Friday because when I come back into the office on Monday, it's like a super shiny, clean desk. It's brilliant. So um, so there's that method. Um, also, I'll use 17 minutes as a time scale when I'm going to call my mum because mm. I keep thinking, you know, if I get on the phone to my mum, she's going to talk for hours. She doesn't really talk for hours. You know, sometimes it's me who's stretching it out to 17 minutes because I think I've got three minutes left. Let's keep chatting with her. So you can use it for lots of things. And I think what's great is you can fit in three of those in an hour, have a little break in between, nip to the loo or whatever, and you will be amazed at what you get over the line. And I use this expression a lot, Joe, get it over the line. What do you need to get over the line? What have you been putting off? I'm a procrastinator, born procrastinator. I put the pro in procrastination. 
If you know procrastination was an Olympic event, I would represent Great Britain and win gold. <laughs> Not the next Olympics. I'll do the one after that. Come on. <laughs> you say that in the book. You say I that do. the definition is somebody who's gotten so good at putting things off that they could be a professional. Absolutely. I love that line. That's it's my favorite line in the book. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a self. Uh, I always say, you know, if you learn how to use your procrastination skills, you can then learn how to put off putting off. You go, I'll put off later. Right now, I got to get it done. That's so you can good. procrastinate, procrastinating if you're really that good at it. I like that. Yeah, we'll be using that. So. <laughs> um, I love the 17 minute sprint, setting off Siri as the alarm, and, and uh, because we lose 17 minutes over and over throughout our day if we're not careful watching YouTube videos or whatever comes into our inbox. So talk to me about um, distractions and, and also maybe the belief systems that, because we're joking about procrastination, but it actually really is an issue. And so oh, yeah. what about what are the belief systems you think that stand in people's way from getting them to go, you know what, I'm going to embrace this concept of 17. I mean, that's, if you're just getting on here, that's the book he wrote. It's, I love how big you made the, the name. You know, it wasn't about you. It was about the, the principle yeah. which is, I love the simplicity of it, but how, what do you think that people have to get over first? So it's this thing about, it's comfortable, isn't it? When we're comfortable, we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. It's a very natural thing. We're designed to do it. And mm -hmm. we were designed to do it many, many years ago when we didn't have YouTube and we didn't have, you know, um, distractions of playing on our phones or scrolling through stuff or whatever. Now we have that and it's so simple and it's so comfortable that what we we don't want to challenge ourselves. So one of the things I talk about a lot in 17 as well is creating accountability. So when you create accountability, you're much more likely to get something done. So make a public declaration of what it is that you want to do. That's what this whole Team 17 thing is about, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. You know, creating teams of people who are there who will keep you accountable. I'm going to do this. I, as soon as I said I was going to write a book in 17 days, I announced it on the 1st of July. I had to have it written by the 17th of July. So so making it public is kind of holds you to it from an accountability standpoint. And you announced you were going to do your book and then wrote it 17 days from the day you announced it? Absolutely. And let me tell you, I was... And you hit the deadline? I made the deadline to the day, but I was behind schedule most of the time. But I knew I had to do it. I couldn't go back to the group and then say, hey, my book 17 is going to be written in 19 days. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> or write it in four months about a book yeah. called 17. Yeah, it's not going to work. And and you know what? My, I wrote my first book. I wrote How to Be Brilliant in four days. What? Because I, because I told a lie. Who are you? I, I, oh, told, okay. I told a lie to the publisher and told her that it was already written. And that was the only way I could get it published that year. So she said, look, we've got one slot, but I'd need the manuscript next week. Is it written? And I went, yeah, it is. And she went, you've not, you didn't tell me that. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's all done. <laughs> and then that was the weekend, Easter weekend. On the Thursday lunchtime, I met the publisher. I rang my wife and I said, cancel everything this weekend. We're writing a book. And we wrote How to Be Brilliant in four days. You are shattering everyone's belief systems right now, everyone's paradigm of how they think about the process of writing a book. But wait a minute, wait a minute. This one. The Edge took me four years. <laughs> was it the first one? No, this was this was the last one before seventeen. The Edge, but the reason for that was I I basically spent four years <laughs> hiding from writing by doing research. Yeah. So I I interviewed two hundred people for that book, and to be honest, Joe, I could have interviewed ten. Because yeah. the uh, next 190 said exactly the same thing. Yeah. You know, one day I'm interviewing Danny Mayer, you know, from Union Square yeah. Hospitality, founder of Shake of course. Shack. And, you, yeah. I did restaurant marketing for four years. I know who he is. Oh, all right. Okay. So you know Danny. And then the next day I interviewed General Sir Mike Jackson, who was head of the British Army. They could swap jobs and still do it. Because what General Sir Mike Jackson was doing with the army is exactly what Danny was doing in restaurants. What Danny was doing in terms of organization was exactly what um, you know General Sir Mike Jackson was doing within the army. These people, it's characteristics. And what, and what I spend my life doing is saying, how do I tap into those characteristics of successful people, yeah. and turn it into something that works for me, and then apply it? That's the trick. 
That's awesome. And you know, you're you're taking what most people would use as excuses and removing them right now because most people think a that a lot of research needs to go into a book. They're also thinking that they have to go through this long process of several months because that's what a publisher might want. There's, there's a lot of beliefs that get in the way. But you're saying just maybe even write the book in 17 minute sprints. It doesn't have to be 17 days, but do it in 17 minute sprints. So you get a chapter done a day or something or absolutely some writing done every day, at least. Absolutely. You know, that's the thing that we because the other thing is we we do focus on what's wrong. Mm -hmm. so you might write you have a day of writing and then you look back and you go, you know what? That's crap. Good. You, you know what looks crap. A lot of people don't know what looks crap and then they publish it. <laughs> They're the problems. If you look back at something and go, well, that's crap, but actually there's a little bit of gold in there and I can work on that bit. I can do that bit. Excellent. The next day, another 17 minute sprint tidying it up. So we call, we say so when you write a book, there's three things you want to be doing. You've got to read a lot. Yeah. You've got to write a lot and you've got to edit a lot. Read, write, edit, repeat. Read, write, edit, repeat over and over and over. You know, and we both know Jeffrey Githam very well. And Jeffrey is the, he's the king of that. Yeah. He will be on doing that over and over and over with a book. That's how he gets it, it over the line. Have you seen how he does it on his wall? Yeah. Brilliant. It's, an, it's amazing. Yeah. He lays and maps it all out on his wall. So you say in the book that what gets scheduled gets done. Yeah. I love scheduling. And I, well, I, I'm a big fan of time blocking. I have seven children in the home, two that are outside the home, and people go, how do I manage it all? And I said, well, if I don't time block, I wouldn't get anything done. But the, the suggestion of go ahead and time block, but do it in 17-minute increments. Yeah, perfect. So we do, we do a thing now with Team 17 where we do something called turbo coaching. So turbo coaching lasts for 17 minutes. Most people, when they do a coaching, they block it in for an hour. Why do they block it in for an hour? Because that's what Outlook says. And you spend you spend 40 minutes of it chatting about nothing and not going into the issue. Within 17 minutes, you can find a main target, what you want to work on, work with your coach, and get it done. So I can effectively do three turbo coaching sessions in an hour and help three people. Now, that, for me, is brilliant. But yes. that's that thing about... It, and it fits into my diary, and you can do 17 minutes. It makes them get to the point of what they need help on faster, too, probably. Well, of course, because when they pre-register, they say, I say, what's the one item that you would like us to solve during this coaching? If we do it in the first five minutes, we'll do something else. If we don't manage to address it, you get your money back. It's easy. Yeah. <clears throat> Love it. Okay, so I have a couple favorite chapters in the book. Let's have them. Okay, one is maybe because of the contrarian title, which is why you shouldn't be in the top 1%. Yes. <laughs> so you have a couple of really good, I mean, they're all good, but you have a couple of really jarring, contrarian, uh, you know, belief shattering titles to your chapters and you back it up with the content. So without giving away all the content, why shouldn't be people try to, why would, shouldn't people strive to be in the top 1%? Because you, not everybody can do it. That's the thing. If by the very nature of the fact that people trying to get into the top 1%, it means 99% of people aren't. And the other thing is I've worked with some very, very high-performing individuals, Olympians, people who've played football for their countries, or soccer, sorry, for their, for their countries, top you know, actors, you know, one of the most famous women in the world who was a model. I've worked with these people. All they think about is being in that top 1%. That's their whole life everything they can't have a family relationship they can't have yeah. a functional significant other because their whole focus has been in that one percent and if you want that so badly that you're prepared to have all the pain that goes with it great knock yourself out i don't want that so i don't want to be in the top one percent i would rather be in the top 17 percent <laughs> three things and if those three things overlap by the very nature of where they're going to overlap, that's the 1% I want to be in. And you know what the wonderful thing is about being in the top 17%, Joe? What's that? Everybody can do it with hard work. Yeah. You don't need to be born with natural talent. You don't need to be the smartest person in the room. You just need to work harder and you can be in the top 17. I love it. So Ken Wall says, I have a, I have copy number 161 of Michael's book, which tells me that 
Uh, mine is what? That's a <laughs> one, three, one, one, three, one. And I didn't just buy one copy um, of your book. I bought a copy for a friend who got one, three, zero, I think. Yeah. So it just tells me we ordered 30 books ahead of Ken, apparently. You know I'll tell you what happened with that. I mean, that was- Yeah, tell me about books. that. Because I, I saw that you only had 999 copies. What was this about? So that was, so basically when I, when we ran this Write That Book Masterclass and I committed to this group of people and said, look, I'm going to write a book at the same time as you. I'm going to publish it and I'm going to sell a thousand copies. And I'm going to show you that you can be, that it can be done and you can self-publish and do it. Because all my books have been with Pearson or um, with Hodder, you know, big publishers. But let's just show you that anybody can do this. And then I did this pitch to pre-sell the book. And I said, and I have no idea why I said it, Joe. Instead of saying, and the first 999 copies will be hardbacked and signed, I said, numbered, hardbacked, and signed. And I was like, so as I said, I thought, Brilliant. Why, did, why did I even say that? What Anyway, it'll be fine. I'm just going to hand number a thousand books. It took four days. <laughs> it took four days to do it. And and there was this, the classic thing was, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever done a book signing, so um, if somebody talks to you whilst you're doing it, you end up writing that thing in the book. It's really crazy. Yeah, there was a the England football managers, a guy called Bobby Robson at one point, and he went on to do lots of lots of great stuff. And he became the Newcastle United manager, which is my my team. And he wrote this book and he did a big signing at St. James's Park at the football stadium. Thousands of people, to, I mean, literally thousands and people queued for six hours to have their book signed. And it's this great story where this young lad came to him, hand over his book and he said, have you signed many of those, Bobby? And he said, thousands, son, thousands, and handed the book back, went away, and the kid opened up his book and said, best wishes, Bobby, thousands. <laughs> yeah, great. So for four days, I'm numbering these yeah, books. Yeah, that's funny. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm trying to make them, if possible, <laughs> special. So there's a, one of the members of our, um, right there, um, one of the members of so How To Be Brilliant group is a secondhand Porsche dealer. So I, I gave him 911. Right, so you got nine one one, um. So you know, portion and and he was blown away by it. Couldn't believe it, you know. Um, Jeffrey Gittimer got eighteen because it's the the Jewish Leclerc thing. Ah, so, gotcha. You know, so he got that, and you know, there's people saying which number books they got. Yeah. And a lot of people said, "Oh, you must have kept number one for yourself," but I didn't. Number one has gone to my first grandchild. So we and uh, the mm -hmm. book's dedicated to Ella Grace, who's our first grandchild. So she got number one. I love that. I I think it was brilliant to do a pre-sale <clears throat> numbered book. I think you also did an upsell. So I got a lot of marketers who are watching this. I have a, my audience is a lot of digital marketers, a lot of consultants who are trying to figure out, uh, you know, marketing for themselves for their clients. Take note on this book launch <clears throat> because I, I I saw you commenting and Jeffrey commenting about your book, new book coming out on his show. So obviously getting exposure, getting on a podcast, getting your, your name out there helps. Other people like Ken on here said he heard about it through Jeffrey. Yeah. But <clears throat> it does give you some sort of FOMO to only put a limit of 999 on it. And so, you know, which yeah. I mean, that was, that was, it was interesting because we have a waiting list of people who would love a copy of the hardback. And I promised that I would only have 999 numbered hardback books. So that's it. I can't break that promise. So right. there's no temptation to print another, or I'll just do another thousand and sell yeah. those. But there w there'll be a paperback. There'll certainly be a paperback. It will be a bit bigger. And my, I might go with a main, mainstream publisher with that. But I thought I need to do something else with this. So I, love audio and i know you're a big fan of audio and you do the podcast mm -hmm. as well so i thought i'll do the audio version of the book but also what i'll do is i'll add a load of bonus material in the audio so there's two hours of additional audio and what people there was if they ordered the book there was this a very very simple click the button and then you could upgrade and get the audio version as well and you won't have to wait for the content of the book 
Yeah, I mean, it's and the brilliant thing about audio is that it it's you've, production cost once, and then after that. So if, if somebody's listening now or watching now, and they kind of go, "I want to buy the book," well, you, sorry, the book isn't available. You might get a second hand one somewhere, but if you go, you know, michaelheppel.com slash seventeen, you can download the audio there. You can get that, um, and I loved doing the audio because I just made a decision right at the beginning. I am not going to correct myself if I get something wrong. So there's mistakes in there. At one point, I start to talk about something. I realize I'm talking about the wrong thing, and I just, I'm just i sorry. Because I wanted it to be like you were with so me. this wasn't like, yeah, published like the Audible. This was your own audio version. Own audio version. Yeah, I love definitely. it. By the way, for those listening, we've got a special gift for everybody here from Michael which he surprised me with before we got on here and told me. So just hang tight for that. So yeah. you, so you just, you just raw recorded the audio. Yeah. And because, and that's, by the way, this is how, you know, I read your book. That's consistent and congruent with what you say in the book about don't try so hard, just be yourself, Definitely. which is also, I think that was, um, I can't remember. I don't have the chapter written here, but I actually have it here. It's one of my questions. What do you mean by don't try too hard? Yeah, but it's that thing about, you know, do you, do you want to be perfect or do you want to be out there? And I think sometimes we kind of get really hung up about things being perfect. Yeah. And a, a great friend of mine, a brilliant marketer called Paul Mort, and Paul started off as a fitness trainer. And then he went on to teach fitness trainers how to make money as fitness trainers. It's very difficult to do. And now he teaches usually men, very successful men, um, how to you know how to live their lives better. Paul writes an email every single day. He's one of these daily email people. And honestly, the mistakes in there and the, the bad grammar and all that type of stuff. And I am looking at this and I look at these emails and I used to, I used to send a message back and say, Paul, you know, and then one day we were out having lunch and I said, Paul, there was emails. He goes, Michael, I need to let you know something. I couldn't give a fuck. I was like, really? He goes, I don't care. I'm sending an email a day and I'm selling stuff. And he said, yeah, other I, people are sat there trying to get something perfect, trying to hone their blog for a month. He says, in that time, I've communicated with my audience 31 times. I, so I, like, God, I really so love this. So my, good, my, Michael. This is everyone needs to be hearing this right now because th this is obviously one of those things that keeps everyone back from doing things like this, having their own show, having a podcast. At the beginning, for some people on here listening, I said to Michael, I hear a little echo coming through on his end when I talk. I can hear myself through his speakers, and we just both kind of went, eh. because. When this gets edited for syndication onto Apple I, Podcasts and all that, my team will edit the audio. Yeah. But we still got to, the show has to go on. We're still going to go on here. It'll bug a couple people, and that's more about them than us. <clears throat> but what do we do? Just stop until we get audio absolutely perfect. It's just not always going to happen. And Ken says it best. He says, perfection kills progression. Perfect. And I think done is better than perfect. So I love this. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I, that I realized was that um, that paralysis of, you know, so everybody knows you you, you got to go live. you got to do live stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's much better to go live. Facebook loves you going live. YouTube loves you going live. All that type of stuff. Yeah, we're on and LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook right now. Exactly. So you kind of, and I, and I just kind of go, yeah, you, you do have to go live, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about it. It's kind of, you know, I used to hate looking at myself on camera. Look at my big fat face and all that type of stuff. Then I looked at some other people doing things. I was like, Shit, <laughs> I look great. <laughs> I used to worry about putting my glasses on. I used to, mm -hmm. to do this. So I would do, I'd be doing my lives and I'd be kind of going, yeah, there's a nice comment coming in here from uh... <laughs> and now I'm just, you know, forget it. If I need to read something, I need to wear my glasses. Pop them on. It's fine. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so another favorite chapter is the one on communication being the great magnifier. That is the magnifier, 100%. And it, you said this is your meatiest chapter, I remember reading. And you have, of course, 17 tips in that chapter. But um, you said if you can't say what needs to be said in 17 minutes or maybe it needs an edit, and then you list out the 17 things that can be part 
of presentations. And you, you say these are 17 things that should be featured in a presentation, which I really enjoyed in, in that list. But maybe you could talk a little bit to that and how this, how does 17 magnify communication? Well, so here's the thing that you and I all know that some people aren't particularly brilliant at their job, but they're great at communicating and they get on. They get promoted before other people. They get yeah. the big bucks. They get the opportunities. They go, well, what? wait a minute. I I did seven years of research into this. And then they just stand up and do it. Yeah, because they can communicate. Yeah. They can tell a story where people want to listen. They can have people leave the conference and go, oh, I love that guy who did. I love that woman who told that story. Rather than the person who stood there with a whole lot of data and slides, which people right. instantly forgot. Yeah. So my, I'm a professional speaker. That's my job. So I stand on stages, I used to, <laughs> all over the world, and uh, and I would present, and I've watched thousands of other speakers, and I watch what they do, and I kind of think, you know what, you are losing these people so quickly because they do the classic thing. I always want to start off by telling you a little bit about me. Guess who cares about you? You and your mother. That's, <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Nobody gives a chuff about you. You know, so I kind of, I, I'll do some information like that, but I also talk about using analogies, using things like the power of three. Um, I, I enjoy telling people about, you know, how to prepare, 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 so that the bit that you teach is the tip of the iceberg. Your knowledge is the bit that's underneath the surface. You only ever teach the tip of the iceberg. Never teach people everything you know. You should never do that. It's fatal to do that. And... And as people learn to communicate better, and whether that's speaking up at a staff meeting, whether it's doing a live broadcast like this, whether it's writing an email as you would speak, however yeah. you would do it, whether it's using you know the, the hippo video stuff and things like that and sending a video message to somebody, the yeah. rules are the same. It's the magnifier. So the, the, all the techniques in 17 are magnified by communication and the accelerator... And this is the bit that isn't in the book, but it's in the bonus chapter, is the team. Surrounding mm. yourself with the right people. Yeah. And in the bonus chapter, we talk about creating this list of 17 people and we have 17 archetypes. You know, who who do you want to have in your corner? How do you get those people to help you? How do you farm that list? And how do you give something back to them? Love it. Okay, real quick, so we gotta keep going. I you Sometimes it's doing nothing at all. It's just thinking. Mm. You say you have a chapter on thinking. On just the, you call it the deep think. I think it's called. Yeah. And so tell us about that because some people don't think of thinking as something they should spend time on. And um, the uh, there's a book by Keith Cunningham called The Road Less Stupid. Yeah. And at the end of every, which is a great business book, but at the end of every chapter, he says, thinking time, and here's what I want you to think about. So talk to me about deep think. So this is not meditation. Right. That's the first thing. So people kind of, you know, everybody talks about meditation, and, and rightly so. A little bit of meditative time each day is very, very good for you. This is thinking time, sitting down and really thinking, going deep with your thoughts. So when we created 17 as a, as a pop-up group one of the things that i decided to do was to have the deep think so and we did it on zoom and it was the funniest thing joe because we had nearly 100 people who came on and i said okay oh all we're going to do now for the next 17 minutes is just think no back <laughs> no background music no notepad no stimulation nothing at all you can look at other people on the screen but that's it so people just sat for 17 minutes like this <laughs> did you record things. it yeah we did two or three interesting things happened one afterwards people said it didn't feel like 17 minutes at all you know it was really really swift i mean it happened very mm -hmm. very quickly second thing was that people thought they were going to think about something and then ended up going somewhere else completely ah uh, interesting yeah, so I, some one person said I was had this idea. I wanted to restructure my business, and I was going to think about that and kind of get into people's minds and all that type of stuff. And then they came out of it and they said, "I've come up with this new idea for a fishing rod." It's like <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was like that's just what happened. And yeah. then 
for other people they had it got frustrating for them because they realized that in the world that we live in right now we are looking for constant stimulation we are being told what to think yeah that's why we that's why we pick up these things and start yeah. flicking through you know we're looking for what do we think i'm being told what to think i'm being given stimulus from somewhere else so to create our own time it's it's challenging it's quite tough but i've done it several times since and i honestly at the end of every single one i can't wait to grab my notepad because there's a bunch of ideas going around well i so you're not suggesting that you think with a notepad just sit and think and just Absolutely. reflect and think right and yeah. and um this is the great social dilemma that we're in and this is the new documentary on netflix that recently came out everyone keeps saying you got to watch the social dilemma my wife and i watched it but it is it's the social media is we're, we're so addicted to that stimulus we're so addicted to where we get our information from digitally yeah. that to go any period of time without it you makes you feel like you lost your wallet or something right you just have that and there's a fomo that comes over us too like we're, like we're missing out when i started cutting news out of my diet years ago actually people still ask me did you hear about this did you see this and i'm like no and I'm a whole lot better for it. <clears throat> okay. Right. Yeah. Let's move on. You talk about um, 17 for your health. Yeah. This removes like all the excuses of like working out. I mean, you like took away mine, which is, you know, if you have a Peloton in the basement, the, you know, the, the bike, <clears throat> you could get on it for 17 minutes. Anybody could find 17 minutes to get on a Peloton bike. And 17 minutes, you can get actually a pretty good workout on that dang thing. You know, the, when we did the 17 minutes or 17 for health, yeah that could be a whole book yeah yeah you i know, saw it. and you have some freebies on your site about it too and oh yeah i mean you can have 17 essential things for your diet 17 ways from to be mindful you could have you know the 17 yeah. minerals your body could do all that type of stuff but we we chose to kind of do some general stuff and then we focus on the 17 workout and the guy who put it together he's called dean colson and dean is brilliant every week he does a live broadcast into my how to be brilliant group on a different health topic and it's his knowledge is out of this world and i said so here's the challenge dean it has to be 17 exercises that can be done in 17 minutes you have to, be able to mix it up and do it in different ways so you don't get bored and you have to use no equipment so you could be in a hotel room you could be you know in your lounge you could be in your bedroom or whatever and he was like, yeah, I'm up for it. And he did it. And he recorded videos to go with each one. It's it's brilliant. And I've oh, done it a few it. times. And it's I am knackered at the end of it. Absolutely <laughs> exhausted. I'm like, shoot, I didn't realize. But yeah. What you can do in that amount of time. Yeah. And you know, you do a beat the week, four 17-minute workouts in a week. You beat the week. That's you done. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to top it off with my... Favorite, favorite chapter, and it's mainly because you offer motivation and confidence in this chapter, which is called Get Back in the Saddle. Mm. And you, of course, list 17 ways to do that. <laughs> um, but I love that because you know, we're coming out of this pandemic, I'm still in it, but coming out of the, I think, the hardest part of it. And people need to get back on the saddle. They do. And it's not just an expression. There's actually, it's like, I think people, they, they get content with getting stuck almost. It's almost like stuck becomes the new warm, new comfort. And they get really stuck when your suggestion in this towards the end of the book is get off of it. There we go. And you can do it with seven, in 17 ways. Can you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I think, I think the thing with that, Joe, is recognizing that we are human and we fail. And we yeah. get things wrong and we quit and we give up too easily and we stop doing the diet and we blame other people and we find self-reflection difficult and to be realistic about all that stuff you know i am i am the best person at screwing things up <laughs> i do it all the time i've got the most forgiving wife in the world because of the amount of times i screw up but what i know is that the saddle is just there and i can get back on it i just need something so whether it's looking back at a past failure that I overcame and using that as the motivator, yeah. whether it's looking at a bit of pain avoidance, 
whether it's you know writing a grateful list and saying i've got so many wonderful things let's add one more you know little things that you can do to help you to get back on the saddle and having those people around you it goes back to that idea of accountability which is such an important part of 17 where where you're able to say oh, you know i haven't I haven't written anything for my book for the last you know two weeks and for someone to go it's all right it's okay i know i felt like that as well but why don't you write something today and send it to me i'd love to read it and suddenly you've got an accountability partner you're back on the saddle you write something they come back with some great feedback and now you can't wait to write so it's being realistic we all fall off the saddle this is getting back in the saddle you talk about lists in the book, of course, because everything's about the 17 lists, list of this and list of that. And you have a lot of your own lists you share in the book, which I think is very, a very powerful way to add your personalization into the book, by the way. Um, and I appreciate you doing that. But I also, because I kind of, everyone likes to know what other people's lists are. Like, what do you, what's your favorite places to eat? What's your favorite books that you read? Your favorite shows? And Michael lists all these favorites of his in there, which is very insightful. If you ever want to send him a gift, by the way. But if um, here's what stood out for me in reading this, which was you said that when you do your list, make them list of 17 because that makes you think more. It's harder to do lists of 17 than, say, for example, 10. Yeah. And I found myself going, hey, I'm going to come up with 17 questions to ask Michael for our talk on 17. Yeah. And that wasn't that easy, actually, because I kind of came up with like 12. And then I'm like, no, no, if for me to ask 17, I need to get, dig a little deeper here. I need to dig a little deeper into the concepts in the book. It kind of forced me to go back and reread a couple chapters and think about what I would ask you. If you didn't already kind of dovetail into it with some of the answers from the previous questions, which you have done a couple of times. So, and then Jeffrey Ginnimer, who's a mutual friend, loves lists, right? Everything's... 9.5 and 10.5 and 17.5. Um, he thinks in lists. His brain literally thinks in everything's a list. He, every talk he gives pretty much is a list. Why, why, um, why do you think this helps people? Well, do you know, the idea of making you work a little bit harder is, is great. So often people will do this classic Facebook post, who's your favorite, whatever. I, I did a post a little while ago. I said, who's your fourth favorite entrepreneur? Sorry. Lynn's asking, you join late. Which book of Michael's are they discussing? And the book is 17 little ways to get things done. Keep going. So, yeah. So it's, it's kind of, who's your fourth favorite entrepreneur? And people kind of go, oh, well, ooh, Richard Branson. And then, and oh, well, hang on. Yeah. Then you got to think a little bit harder. So when you get yeah. to 17, then you have to think really hard. Could you list 17 entrepreneurs who you even admire? And, and why and as you get further down the list you start to think about who oh, actually i really like that about that person i saw them when they did this or they might be the most successful they mightn't be a you know elon musk but they are this person and it's kind of when, when you do that when you do the um the the pushing yourself so like i i wrote these lists and i wrote them with my wife with with christine so i'm talking about 17 places well, that we, where we love to eat. I thought this is going to be easy. I got to 12 and I got stuck. And then we started looking back through our diary and we started looking at holidays and then we had these lovely memories. And then we went, oh God, I remember we were in Italy and we went to that place that was on the agro-tourism trail. That was probably one of the best meals ever. Why isn't that in? Oh, we'll put that in. And, we, and then we got the photographs out and it was so lovely to do that. Now it was from writing a list. If I had a top 10, I would have done it in five minutes it was a top 17 it was a lovely evening yeah i love that okay let's say we've got some people that are in sales watching how do they incorporate this principle of 17 into their sales process or sales regimen do you know that's what a good question it's definitely not make 17 calls <laughs> <laughs> because i think it needs a bit more than that mm -hmm. i would say 17 minute sprints would be brilliant for anybody in sales get stuff done get stuff over the line i would say that w being in the top 17 percent of three things in sales definitely communication is a definite one for people in sales I would I would do that and get back on the saddle. Oh my goodness. Getting back in the saddle that is a huge one. Overcoming rejection in sales. You know, just dealing with that rejection 
and those times when it doesn't work out and getting back in the saddle and getting back out there and saying, hey, Siri, 17-minute countdown, and then getting, I'm going to call people for 17 minutes. I'm going to make videos for people for 17 minutes. Yeah. You, you, I was going to ask you the same question on how would a coach or consultant incorporate this, but you gave that suggestion earlier. You actually said um, the turbo coaching idea, which is yeah. a coach could use this to be more effective and much more efficient with the time that they're spending with somebody. They could probably get a lot more accomplished, get, do better coaching, more effective coaching in 17 minutes than they could in 60 where they're really just wasting time. Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a real coach because <laughs> a, a real coach would ask you. You've been coaching for the last 40 minutes. What are you talking about? This is great. Yeah, I know, but it's what people normally do is they ask all the questions and they'd have, you will be looking for this moment of discovery. And then suddenly Joe goes, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Whereas what I, what I do is I'll say, tell me the challenge. What's your challenge? Okay. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of ideas. Use this, test that, think about this, do that, do that. And at the end of it, I want people to say, I tested four of Michael's ideas. Two of them worked brilliantly. One was all right. One I will never do again. That was rubbish. I'd much rather have that and do that rapidly than kind of, you know, the first time I worked with a coach, my very first coach, he said to me on my first session, the two hardest decisions you will make when working with a coach are these. One, do I engage a coach and start to pay for somebody? Secondly, the day you want to stop using me as your coach. <laughs> and he said, they'll be the two hardest decisions you'll make working with a coach. And he said, the first decision you have to make now, the second decision I will make for you when you're ready. I like I that. Like, wow. I love that. Okay. This has been too good. I don't want to stop, but I also want people to be able to get what you said you were going to offer to my listeners, to the viewers who are catching this. First of all, where can they find more information about you? Where do you, where do we, we want to send everyone? Well, I mean, michaelheppel.com slash 17 is where you can get the bonus chapter. It's where you can order the audio and where you can find out about something called team 17, which is what I want to talk about now. Okay. Because team 17 is it's like my exclusive team of people. Yeah. We've got a bunch of people who have been on this uh, session tonight. who have been leaving comments and stuff. And this is a group of people who I've never known anything like them. First of all, no, not a single person has joined thinking, I want to get this out of it. They all join thinking, what can I give to it? So at the moment we have 75 members and I'm going to lock it at a hundred. So when we have a hundred, that's it. Well, there you go with that scarcity thing again. Yeah. So I love it. Now, you can, the way that it works is that you, you, you pay, you can either pay annually or you can pay a monthly subscription. What I want your people to do is to think, I want to do a monthly subscription, but I'm going to test Team 17. Okay. So if you join Team 17, it'll say monthly subscription, click on there. Do you have a coupon code? The answer will be yes. My coupon code is SOTO. S O T O. You put that in and you won't pay for your first month. And you come in and you test us. But I have to say, don't join unless you're prepared to give something to the group as well. To share your knowledge, to share some ideas, to support other people. Because that's how it works. Now, if you want to, at the end of um, 17, uh, after your first month, if you want to say, it's not for me, that's fine. Just cancel. It won't cost you a penny. Download all the all the stuff while you're there. Why not? Pinch it all. Go for it. I don't care. I'd, ra I'd much rather that you were giving it a test and then making a decision rather than thinking, oh, am I going to commit to something? So normally it's um, £99, which is about, I think, about $120 these days. But get your first month for free. Test us out and see what you think. So that's, um, and there's some people from Team 17 talking about it. I've never known anything like it, Joe. The people are unreal. And we need, we do, one of the things we do in there, uh, we do 17th day of each month. We do day 17. Most people start planning their month on the first day of the month. We do it on the 17th day. And everything's recorded. So the whole of, the, the whole of day 17 is recorded, what we do, and you can access that. We do Team 17 University, Kajabi University course where you go and you can do 17 different modules, learn all the stuff, extra stuff that's not in the book. We have all that there. You can do um, 
and we have 17 minute sprints we do a thing called massive action project which again is in the book where people create a massive action project and you have an accountability group that looks after you that says come on let's help you to get over the line with this um we do 17 minutes with which are interviews where i've interviewed some extraordinary people i mean absolutely amazing people and we've got more lined up and before we did this i asked joe if he would do a 17 minutes with so joe's going to do a 17 minutes with and we go we just get into some stuff and it's like a short snappy you can download a podcast version you can watch the video version um and it, it's the the best thing i've ever created ever without a doubt it's amazing so for the listeners people who aren't watching it's michael heppel so it's M I C H A E L H E P P E L L dot com forward slash seventeen. Yep, absolutely. Just and at least Google until it fills up, or in, you know, you'll always keep it around a hundred people as what you're. Yeah, max. there'll be a hundred people in in the group. I think after that, I, I'm going to have to definitely close it and lock it for a while because I don't want to have something which is which I can't be part of. I'm very much a part of it. I'm there every day. You know, we have wow. a private Facebook community where people are sharing ideas. You know, it's it's extraordinary. So, I mean, George George is a member. He's it's yeah. great to see him there. Yeah, yeah. I see so, several of your fans are on here with us live, and I appreciate you guys coming on here and supporting Michael. This has been awesome. And um, and Steve says it's an investment rather than a cost. That's exactly right. And you're investing in yourself. Well, Steve, let me tell you a bit about Steve to give you an idea of the person that he is. Okay, this go back to Steve is, here. This guy is the principal of a college, a further education college in a really tough area in the UK. And he joined our initial 17 pop-up group and was so supportive of the idea with the book. There's a 1,000 copies. Steve bought 100 of them. For staff and pupils at the college. I saw that for students. He said they love them. Yeah, and the it. students are using it. The staff are using it. I was like, man, this is this is in education. How cool is that in education? And Steve has the vision to do that. And and it's like, you know, I was kind of, I'll do anything for you. And he went, No, no, I want to do more for you. I mean, what's that about? It's incredible. The the, the when I got the book. I was pleasantly surprised how unique and different it was. It it re, it's very readable. It's very actionable, um, and I immediately knew that I wanted you to have, be one of the earlier guests on this show. So I'm really pleased you came on here, Michael. This has been awesome. I want to keep going, but in the interest of time, we're going to have to end it. But maybe you'll come back sometime and talk more about this as you continue to hone this concept and these ideas with your private group. Yeah, I mean, it would will, it will be, be a pleasure to do that, Joe. And, you know, thank you. I mean, thank you, first of all, for putting it out there. Yeah, it's of course. hard, you know, to make decisions. And people. sometimes people say, oh, you know, this. all I want to do is, you know, I, I, I just want to build my business. And I just want to do, do that, whatever. It's contribution first. The business stuff doesn't come for a long time. Right. So you put it out there. You put it out there. You put it out there. I've been watching some of your past episodes look at the stuff that you do so thank you for doing what you do the people who are watching and listening to this they're the ones that are extraordinary because it takes time that's right we've, bat we've yacked on now for 54 minutes so yeah. appreciate if you stuck with us um but it takes time and it's an investment of that time so i hope you've got good value from that and i'll continue to help you know and find anywhere you find me you know connect on linkedin and all that gubbins i'll just keep doing stuff for you because this is what I'm born to do, and I would love to help. Well, I'm excited to meet you in person someday. I know you're across the pond right now. But when the world opens back up, maybe sometime we can we can break bread together. Thanks again for being the guest. Thanks for not being average, right? <laughs> thanks for not being average. And thanks for being on here, Michael Heppel. I appreciate you and uh, all the things that you're doing and the good that you're doing in the world, man. God bless. Thank you. All right, everyone. Till next time. I insist that you also not be average and go start the 17 minutes uh, sprints. Love it. Bye, everyone. Tune in next week for the Not Your Average Joe Show with international business mentor Joe Soto. 